Hello, everyone. Today, we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the origin of multicellular animals from unicellular protozoans. So, let's jump right in. Fifty-two episodes into this series, and we have finally left the Kingdom Animalia, dropping us off at least 650 million years ago in the Cryogenian period. Everything we've encountered so far, from sponges to corals to beetles to birds to humans, is a multicellular eukaryotic phagotroph, meaning they survive by consuming other organisms. We'll meet more multicellular eukaryotes along the way, like plants, which are phototrophs, capable of self-feeding via photosynthesis, and fungi, which are osmotrophs, feeding by absorbing dissolved organic compounds via osmosis. And we'll meet some other phagotrophs too, like amoebozoans and ciliates. However, none of the clades we're going to meet satisfy all three characteristics that typify animals. In the lungfish's tale, we discussed the meaning of the word fish. In everyday life, we use that word to refer to all vertebrates except for the land-living tetrapods, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. But that's what we call a paraphyletic grouping, wherein a subset is excluded from the whole taxon. If we were to define fish to be monophyletic, as a clade, then all tetrapods would be fish too. There is a similar situation regarding the kingdom Protista. Protist has traditionally referred to any eukaryote that is not a plant, nor fungus, nor animal. This approach doesn't really work since it's defined by arbitrarily excluding taxa without actually describing the members of the taxon itself. Some taxonomists, such as Thomas Cavalier Smith, have proposed to split the protists up into two separate kingdoms, Protozoa, the animal-like protists that tend to be heterotrophic, and chromista, the plant-like protists which tend to be phototrophic. However, the definitions for either are not consistent because they still end up lumping various organisms together in a dubious manner, creating so-called wastebasket taxa. This became especially clear when phylogenetics came along. Biologists quickly learned that some protists are more closely related to animals than they are to other protists, like coanoflagellates, which is why they get the tail. Other protists are more closely related to fungi, like nucleariids. Some are more closely related to plants, as in numerous algal groups. And some are possibly not related to any of these three, such as the clade excavata that we'll meet in a few tales. Protista then simply refers to all eukaryotes, or it is invalid. At any rate, let's begin our backwards trek out of Animalia. In the previous video, we discussed the argument for why sponges appear to be sister to the rest of the animals. Picture then a simple ascanoid sponge. Now picture the object of our tale, a coanoflagellate. How we got animals from protozoan ancestors is the subject of today's tale. Coanoflagellata is a clade of unicellular and colonial protozoans, so named for their flagellum being surrounded by a collar of microvilli called the coanos, or collar complex, which are used to ensnare bacteria. The presence of this feature in coanoflagellates and most animals is the reason the clade uniting them is called coanozoa, meaning coanos bearing animals. The protozoan beats its flagellum, creating a current that sucks in prey. Once the prey is caught on the microvilli, pseudopodia are extended from the body to phagocytize it. Coenoflagellates are found in marine and freshwater environments worldwide from the Antarctic to the Atacama Desert. Finding aquatic protozoans in the usually deadly hypersaline bodies of the Atacama Desert came as quite a surprise to researchers, especially since those waters are also exposed to toxic heavy metals and extreme ultraviolet radiation. But life finds a way. Despite the collar complex existing in coanoflagellates and most animal clades, except for tenophores and a secondary loss in ectozoans, some researchers have argued that the collar complex of coanoflagellates and animals is convergent, not homologous. This argument is based on some subtle ultrastructural form and function differences between coanocytes and coanoflagellates. 
However, as Brunette and King point out, quote, the absence of a true color complex from all non coanozoans suggests that it is unlikely to evolve easily through convergence, close quote. They attribute differences between the two to natural selection over the more than 600 million years separating the lineages. The first description of a coenoflagellate was by American naturalist Henry James Clark in 1866, and he immediately recognized the similarities between these protozoans and sponge coanocytes. English marine biologist William Saville Kent also enthusiastically supported this relationship, even naming one colonial coenoflagellate Proterra spongia, meaning first sponge. Proterra spongia has since been falsified as a genus, apparently being the colonial stage of the life cycle of various coenoflagellate species. Though some researchers have suggested that coenoflagellates might be paraphyletic to animals, or that coenoflagellates might be simplified sponges, genetic analyses have strongly contradicted these assignments, placing all extant coenoflagellates in a single monophyletic clade sister to Animalia. All coenoflagellates are covered by an extracellular matrix called the periplast, and the makeup of the periplast is diagnostic to the family level. In addition, coenoflagellates are covered in a glycocalyx, fine fibrils that coat the outer surface of the cell. Many coenoflagellates have a theca, which is a cup or vase-shaped structure that surrounds the cell, and a stalk that anchors to the substrate. The basis of both the theca and stalk appears to be carbohydrate fibrils embedded in an amorphous matrix. Reproduction in coenoflagellates appears to alternate between sexual and asexual reproduction, which is common for many protozoans. A 2013 paper by Tara C. Levin and Nicole King explored reproduction in Salpingica rosetta. Under conditions of nutrient limitations, these haploid cells sexually fuse into diploid individuals. However, both haploid and diploid coenoflagellates can undergo asexual reproduction. And remember that the mating system of animals is oogamy. Large immobile eggs are fertilized by much smaller motile sperm. For coenoflagellates, slightly smaller motile male gametes fertilize slightly larger motile female gametes, making their mating system anisogamous. There are two orders of coenoflagellates, Craspidida and Acanthicida. Craspidida contains the most well-known of all coenoflagellates, Monocygia brevicolis. In 2008, Nicole King et al. sequenced its genome, finding about 9,200 genes. M. brevicolis has a genome size of 41.6 million base pairs, which is similar in size to filamentous fungi and free-living protozoans, but much smaller than most animals. The team also found that introns and coenoflagellates are much shorter than those of eumetazoans, indicating a proliferation of introns early in animal evolution. A 2020 paper by Rosa Fernandez and Tony Gabaldon confirmed that holozoan and early animal evolution witnessed a massive increase in gene duplications, followed by subsequent gene loss in different clades of animals. Another observation of that King et al. study was that coenoflagellates possess many of the genetic domains that animals have. Cell adhesion receptor domains like C-type lectin, cadherin, immunoglobulin, and integrin alpha. Extracellular matrix domains like collagen triple helix domain, fibronectin type 3 and laminin G. And transcription factor families like P53, MYC, and SOX TCF. Four Kedbox proteins are shared among opisthokonts, i.e. animals, coenoflagellates, philisterians, ichthyosporians, and fungi, and homeodomains are shared among all eukaryotes. What the possession of all these genes for cell adhesion and extracellular matrices implies is that animals didn't have to invent a repertoire of new genes for multicellularity to emerge. Instead, they merely had to co-opt existing genes for new functions, which they evidently did. Other craspidids reversibly form connected monolayer balls called rosettes, similar to the situation in the alga volvox, such as the aptly named spherica volvox. Such protozoans, as well as carnivorous plants like the Venus flytrap and sundew, were thought by certain naturalists, like Erasmus and Charles Darwin in the 1700s and 1800s respectively, and A.C. Hardy in the 1950s, to represent a transitional form between plants and animals. The thinking was that when nutrients like phosphorus became limited, perhaps 
certain plants switch to a life of heterotrophy. There is a kernel of truth to this. Carnivory does evolve in plants where nutrients are scarce, but no plant has ever evolved into an animal. Both are descended from a flagellated common ancestor, but plants may have gone on a track that couldn't generate an animal-like form because along the way they incorporated cyanobacteria as an endosymbiont, anchoring them to a more sessile photosynthetic lifestyle. Another coenoflagellate, Salpingica rosetta, illustrates this contingent aspect to evolution as it forms colonies of hollow balls or chains via multiple rounds of incomplete cytokinesis depending on the presence of the bacterium Algorophagus machiponganensis. In 2019, a new species of coenoflagellate called Coenica flexa was discovered that forms cup-shaped colonies which rapidly collectively invert their shape in response to changing light levels. As for Acanthicida, these members contain themselves within a basket made of silica called a lorica. These species produce strips of silica to form the lorica. It was previously thought that members of Acanthicida could be neatly split into nudiform species that have a motile dispersal stage after cytokinesis, and tectiform species that do not. However, more recent phylogenetic analyses recovered the nudiform species emerging from within the paraphyletic tectiform grouping. The Acanthicid diaphanica spherica makes a hollow ball of related individuals within a lorica. However, the individuals are not connected, so this doesn't seem to be a path towards animalia. Bizarrely, the capacity of acanthicids to form the lorica seems to have been borrowed from diatoms. The closest gene relatives of coenoflagellate silicon transporter type genes are found among the diatoms, meaning that horizontal gene transfer has occurred between these vastly different clades of eukaryotes. As interesting as these lorica-forming coenoflagellates are, they were not involved in the origin of animals. Coloniality, i.e. the joining of unrelated individuals into a colony, is not how complex multicellularity has originated in any lineage of eukaryotes. Not red algae, green algae, kelp, fungi, or animals. In all lineages of complex multicellular eukaryotes, the game is always the same. Clonal replication of somatic cells. Your liver cells, skin cells, nerve cells, and stomach cells have exactly the same DNA in them. The only difference between them is which genes are expressed. This prevents competition among cells. Gametes must be genetically different so that offspring are different from the parents, but the somatic cells of an individual must all be the same. Cancer is a pernicious example of genetic differentiation within somatic cells. So, a rosette-like ball of coenoflagellates is likely ancestral to animals, but that ball would have been formed entirely of clonal individuals. Experiments with unicellular Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Chlamydomonas reinhardii have shown that the failure to separate cells following cytokinesis can result in individuals composed of multiple clonal cells. We discussed such experiments in Experimental Evolution Part 1. But a rosette of coenoflagellates does not a sponge make. Another important feature is the ability to differentiate cells into separate tasks. Again, this can evolve easily as documented by Saccharomyces experiments. In those, the new snowflake morphology came with the differentiation of roles in which a large individual would cause apoptosis in some cells, leading to the separation of daughter branches from the parent. Similarly, the division of labor in a pre-sponge's cells would involve some flagellated individuals giving up their swimming capabilities to become flattened, anchoring pinacocytes. These pinacocytes would secrete molecules to form an extracellular matrix made of mucopolysaccharide and collagen that would form the supportive mesohyl between coenoflagellate layers. This was the very first separation of a coenoderm from pinacoderm and the very earliest pre-sponges. With this very simple early animal, further elaboration of both the coenoderm and pinacoderm for processing more food from water, and the differentiation of cell types for specialized purposes could be selectively advantageous. And animals didn't need to work on their own. They could, like corals and many other animals today, have cultivated symbiotic relationships with bacteria to supplement their diet. Numerous sponges today do in fact harbor either cyanobacteria or eukaryotic green algae for this exact purpose. 
But when did animal cells evolve the capacity to switch between morphologies, you might ask? Well, they didn't have to. The closest protozoan relatives of animals were already capable of switching between morphologies. Sponge archaeocytes are capable of switching to coenocytes and pinacocytes, similarly to how Salpingica rosetta can switch between individual cells, pelagic rosettes, and individuals anchored by a stalk to sediment. Switching between amoeboid and flagellated forms is known to occur in eukaryotes as distant from us as the excavate Naglaria. One hypothesis for the origin of different cell types in animals involves merely changing the timing of cell morphology switching. This hypothesis is called the temporal to spatial transition since it involves multiple cell morphologies coexisting but in different locations on the multicellular individual. Another hypothesis is called the division of labor. This refers to the fact that unicellular organisms must have one cell perform a variety of factors, such as perception, movement, feeding, and division, that different cell types and animals can do separately. In reality, both of these hypotheses likely contributed to the origin of animal cell types. So, we have a small pre-sponge, perhaps similar in constitution to Eosiathospongia, with cells capable of differentiating between at least archaeocytes, pinacocytes, and coanocytes. By duplicating and diversifying transcription factors into families of genes, this would allow early animals to generate more and more cell types. The next stage of animal evolution would be the formation of an aquiferous system that could occur by enclosing the coanocytes within a vase-shaped layer of pinacocytes. Evolutionary biologist Thomas Cavalier Smith proposes a series of other changes that could evolutionarily carry sponges to diploblastic animals, but that takes us afield of our present purposes. A question we might have is, why did animal type multicellularity not evolve repeatedly among the coanozoans? Cavalier Smith offers the following answer, quote, primarily because it is selectively immensely harder for organisms that feed by swallowing others or bits of them, a purely eukaryotic propensity, to switch from intracellular phagocytosis, as in amoebae or ciliates, to eating with a multicellular mouth and gut whose cells have novel functions and structures absent in their unicellular ancestors. Animal feeding is effective only if novel cell types cooperate at a higher organizational level. Most give up the ability to feed or reproduce. Huge selective disadvantages not easily overcome. Close quote. And that's the Coenoflagellate's tale. A protozoan similar to a Coenoflagellate gave rise to the kingdom Animalia by a series of relatively simple changes in the timing and placement of different life cycle cell morphologies. So thanks for watching and we'll see you all next time.